So, welcome everyone to the online launch, we hope, of Darkness in the City of Light by Tony Curtis, who's going to be in conversation this evening with Professor Matt Jarvis. I'm Mick Fulton, I think a lot of you probably know. I'm the publisher at Seren. Uh, some of you, but not all of you, may know that Seren is celebrating its 40th birthday this year. Yeah. And remarkably, we've been publishing the work of Tony Curtis for almost as long. His first book of, um, with Seren, uh, a poetry collection called Letting Go, really winsome picture of Tony on the back. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, appeared in 1983. Since then, there have been a further eight volumes of poetry, including most recently From the Fortunate Isles, which is a new and selected poems. In addition, Tony has edited three poetry anthologies, three anthologies about writing uh, of various aspects of Wales, two groundbreaking books of interviews with artists from Wales, plus a new edition of Joseph Herman's classic Related Twilights, a collection of essays about Seamus Heaney, which was actually the first critical work on Seamus Heaney, a collection of essays about Wales and war, and one of my favourites, Wales the Imagination, this goes back a long time, um, which is a, a gro another groundbreaking book about art and identity in Wales, and as I said, a, a particular favourite of, of mine. Oh, and he also wrote the um, South Pembrokeshire volume in our real series, and there was a collection of short stories from another publisher, and there have been plays read through at the Sherman Theatre, and I may have missed something amongst all that. But all of which is to say that Tony has made an enormous contribution to Seren's lists over the years and also to writing in Wales. He's got some recurring themes in his work, in particular war and art and Wales. The first two of these, War and Art, feature in his new book, Darkness in the City of Light, which is surprisingly in the genre previously untouched by Tony Curtis, the novel. And what a novel it is. So here to discuss this latest venture are Matt Jarvis and Tony Curtis. So, Matt. Thank you very much, Mick. Yeah, I just thought I'd hold this up to the screen. I'm going to read something from the back cover because I like it. The City of Light under German occupation. Paris, a place, a people, lives in flux. And among these uncertainties, these compromised loyalties, these existences under constant threat, lives Marcel Petiot, a mass murderer. A doctor, a resistance fighter, a collaborator, who can tell? Not even the people he kills. So um, that's it. That's the new book, um, Darkness in the City of Light. Um, it wasn't always called that, Tony, was it? No, it was called Occupied Territory. And in fact, uh, uh, a workshop play, Occupied Territory, was, was uh, presented in the Sherman studio a long time ago, something like 35 years ago. It was so long ago that there were back projections of slides and, and the Germans marching in and so on. But 30, 38 years or so ago, one couldn't find out much about Marcel Pet Petio. There was a book which I acknowledge at, at the back of this novel um, by Gombrich, um, which I now realize was a, a partial view Marcel Petio. And that's both the dilemma and the strength here, that there, there is not one Marcel Petio. There are many. And I've added to that. Instance. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this novel is it, it's multiplicity in lots of ways, and we'll certainly get onto that. Uh, and it's very interesting that it, it runs quite a long way back in your career under its yeah. previous iteration. So I, I wonder if you could explain where your interest in this case, and obviously I'm using that word advisedly, uh, this case emerged from. And perhaps as part of that, could you explain um, the case itself a bit for people who may not know about it, who haven't yet read the novel, although I'm sure they will go on to do so. Or many dozens of websites, uh, some of them very garish and hammer horror, which deal with Marcel Petio. It seems to be a continuing um, subject of people's fascination in a good and a bad way. The answer is, I can't remember. I was certainly working about war, working about art, as Mick pointed out, in the early 80s and through to the mid 80s. My poetry was changing from being a confessional poetry about you know, the death of parents and, 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 and fatherhood and so on, 
um, into a more historically based writing. So I was writing a lot of poems, um, which were eventually collected um, under the title uh, War Voices, where I inhabited characters who were in uh, having experience of warfare, which, which in my generation couldn't possibly have. And I found that exciting and challenging. I suppose the seeds were always there um, because darkness in the city of light, as you and I know, because <laughs> we both read it, is not, is not told by a single narrator and is never told, I might argue, by a, a reliable narrator either. There's not one patio, there are many. When I went, revisited uh, occupied territory, I realized there were more things to be done. You can find out much more about Paris uh, under the Nazi occupation now very easily, and also about everything else was going on there. So I started, I could answer questions which I'd always had in the back of my head. Paris was occupied, but what actually, what did that mean? What happened? Um, Picasso was there, wasn't he? What did he do? He carried on painting. <laughs> Brock carried on painting. Coco Chanel carried on being Coco Chanel, uh, as did uh, uh, Chevalier and others. Um, so that's interesting that the occupation was um, had, had gradients of severity to various people. Um, so the novel, in a sense, has its origins in, in saying, what can we find out about Marcel Petio, this man who was accused of murdering 24, 25 people, but said, oh no, it was 147, and they were all enemies of France. How the hell could that happen in the most sophisticated uh, European city without anybody noticing? Well, it was occupied territory. Yeah, um, so I mean, that's, that's really useful. That gives us a sense of A, who you're dealing with, the multiplicity of petios, Petio, um, and the, and also the fact that it's also a geographical novel. It's a novel of a city. Uh, interestingly, Mick said that the novel, this was the form you hadn't engaged with before, but wow. of course, this is a most unusual novel. And there's two things that, that occur to me. Um, the death, your poem that run the, that won the national poetry competition in, well, back in 1984. Uh, 18, 1873, I think it was. <laughs> Maybe not that long ago, <laughs> but the, that's the death of Richard Beatty right. Seaman in the Belgian Grand Prix. Um, that was a narrative poem, wasn't it? I mean, you've always been fascinated by narrative. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 coming across Browning, I think in the sixth form, and then, or as an undergraduate, and, and then uh, Robert Frost. Uh, I thought this was this was an interesting way of writing poetry. And the single most important thing that happened to me and to Margaret at Swans University was around 1967, Danny Absey came. We were lucky in Swansea. We had the, some really good writers coming, um, the English Society. Danny came and his poems did tell stories. And it was a voice I could respond to. And you could understand these poems. That was a revelation. I want to write like that. Particularly his great poem, um, in the theatre, um, which is which is, is is dramatic and compelling, but also narrative, that opened up all kinds of possibilities for me, and and maybe this is the culmination of those. And um, it's interesting we're talking about stories, narratives, multiple petios, because the back cover. Now I don't know whether this was you or whether this was Mick as publisher, but the back cover describes this work as a multi-form novel. And I, I, I was lucky enough to see the manuscript in early phase. And one of the things that excited me about it was was its plurality, the fact that it does loads of different things formally. And I wrote to Mick and I said, "Come on, Mick, you've got to publish this. This is exciting. It's different. It's it's wildly." Uh, plural in its in its um in its in its approach but i was interested what you thought you were doing you know it's described as a multi-form novel on the back cover what did that mean in practice for you as in writing it and why is that perhaps important to what you've done well i was delighted of course thank you very much that, that you you recognized that and forwarded that and that, that mick also and that there are his words in the back cover um uh, that, that he recognized what it was. I didn't know what it was until it, in a sense, became that. I knew that I was interested in Petio. I knew that that was too narrow, that one ought to be interested in 
occupied territory, as in terms of Paris, occupied territory in terms of the human being almost being possessed by, by evil, although that was to hammer horror as well. So somewhere between those, I wanted to negotiate what, in what sense one could be occupied and what that would mean for people. And so when I looked look further into it, of course, I'd forgotten that Samuel Beckett was there, he was in the resistance. You know, that, 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 that all kinds of characters, Josephine Baker actually wasn't there, she'd gone. So who was actually in Paris between 40 and 45? What happened in 46, apart from, spoiler alert, Petio gets guillotined. Of course he did. This is not a who done it. We know who done it, and he did it 140 odd times. And of course he got guillotined. And that was probably the end of the novel as you first saw it. It goes a little further than that now. But again, I was able to ask after Petio, what happened to his widow? What happened to his son? What happened to the huge amounts of money that he made from his victims? So it became uh, endlessly, for me, and uh, anyway, endlessly absorbing. Every question raised an answer that led to more questions. So the book grew out of that questioning. Did it grow? Is that why it's so formally various? Because it, it's, it emerged out of questioning. So your answers yeah. were in lots of different approaches. I mean, you even see it in the typefaces. You, you seem to have had glorious fun with the typefaces across the book. You're right, I did. And for that, I must thank my, my son, Gareth, who, who looked at it again in an early version, and said, you're doing something with the fonts here, but I think you can do more. I thought, well, yes, of course you can. It's so easy. I, I, I wrote... I wrote a book called uh, um, um, How to Study Modern Poetry. And I described my early days as a student with, with, a, with a manual typewriter. And then the revelation is later of an electric typewriter. That's, that's a steam engine. Now we've got computers. Now we've got keyboards. And you can try out various fonts, various typefaces. And that, I don't know. I haven't explored that to the extent that I, I could have. I'm wondering if other writers explore that to the same extent. You can you can you can have all kinds of special effects. So why not? Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I remember seeing on page, oh I think it's page 150. Um, let's see if I can get a, a visual a visual on that. You create something that looks so it's not trying to be realist, but it looks it gives the impression of, of sort of form. Move back, move back a little bit more yeah a report. Um, yeah central organization for deported Jews. Yeah, yeah. well Yes, it does look like a cold, calculating handling of what is an incredibly painful human situation. Um, so the typefaces are important. The novel, that's what it is, also has photographs. And I was keen to have that as well. And there are a couple of disappointments. Nick and I tried our darndest to get a couple of photographs, which because of copyright, we couldn't. Nevertheless, I mean, the cover is great. I mean, you've got got the Eiffel Tower and Hitler, apart from Venice and cats, you can't have a better cover than that, can you? <laughs> yeah, there's um, there's a joke, isn't there, in the cover? Don't you see some something as a bit of a a bit of a gag? Nick said, I think they're going to publish this, and I said, well, is it going to be soft, soft back, hard back? He said, he said, I think it'll have French flaps, and I go forward for a while. And what do you, it's you know, it's set it off in my parish. You're going to have French flaps. Um, how camp darling. But it works wonderfully because on the back cover is Patio, and then he's the cover even sort of bisects him, so that you don't see the whole Patio. And in a way, I mean, this is almost like performance art as well. This is the novel that reaches parts other novels have never reached. <laughs> so, Tony, I mean. You are best known as a poet, and we've touched on some of the ways in which this uh, this book might relate to this writing. That's what David uh, Jones called his stuff, wasn't it? Writing in that complexity. Yeah. So um, can, can you, I'm just interested about if you could talk a bit more about how you see this as relating to your career as a poet. I mean, I know some of it's poetry, yeah? I hope that this book makes, it, makes enough of a splash for people to say, who the hell's this guy? Let's check out his poetry. I'm essentially a poet. And there's another, I hate to confirm for Mick and, and, and other people, so there is another collection of poetry you know, in, in, somewhere in, in the word process of it. But this, I've enjoyed this tremendously. 
And I have to say, I really want to do another one. Uh, and, and actually, I've started another one. But that, that, that is another story in both senses. Um, where does this fit in? I, I think it brings together, if anyone ever bothered to, to, to look at you know, my career as a writer, they would see this as a coming together of the narrative voice in poetry, of a concern with history, um, of that sort of ventriloquism that I've been accused or applauded in the past. Um, it's a combination, um, but actually it's not a finishing point. I want to go on from here. That's very interesting. I'm going to come back and ask you about how you're going to go on from here. But I wonder if you'd be so kind as to read us a bit, a couple of bits, something. Yeah, like... I'll read a couple of bits. Just at the beginning, the other question was, like, um, the Nazis conquered Paris. They, were, they, they ruled it for almost five years. Where was Hitler? And what's amazing is, if you ask people, like, where was Hitler? He visited Paris for a total of six hours. He flew in quietly went round to all the sites that he, he was interested in and flew out again. This morning, we took the short flight from Cobain to Le, Le Bourget Airport. The land, our land, was dark and rose-hued. Speer was impressed by the sight of Paris stretched out before us. He will surely rise to the task of exceeding whatever they have done here. Berlin will be the center of Europe, the world's great capital, envied by all. Hitler has ordered him to measure the Champs Elysees and ensure that our Unter der Linie in Berlin is 20 meters wider. And Brecker's statues will line the grand avenues and parks, he says. I assure the Fuhrer that my studio is already a substantial workshop. My assistants are up to the task, no matter how ambitious. And that's, that's, um, that is Hitler's uh, favorite artist, the, the, the sculptor of sort of homoerotic fascist figures, um, who accompanies Hitler, who, who's there with Hitler and Speer, in that open-top Mercedes, going through an almost deserted Paris very early in the morning, you know, before the croissants were done. Um, and that's odd. This must have been a great triumph for him. But it was almost as if he was afraid, and that comes out, I think, in that passage, he was afraid to acknowledge how great Paris was. Because there was the challenge. He was building the Third Reich. Could he make Berlin surpass Paris? Of course not. It was another you know, broken Nazi dream. Get a bit further into the novel, again asking, you know, Hitler was there for six hours. Coco Chanel lived in, um, in the Ritz, in a suite of rooms, um, uh, ne next to Goering's suite. I mean, what is going on? The thing about Paris was it wasn't bombed. Only in the last few months and the outskirts uh, were bombed. So Paris, unlike London, you could stay at the Ritz in, in, in safety. At the end of the war, there was a, this incredible, uh, but not exhaustive, soul searching. How did we let this happen, the French said? What, what actually happened? And so in a section called, I don't ask my lovers for their passports. Here's a memo, in strictest confidence, a memo, Colonel Walters to Captain Jeffries. With regard to Madame Coco Chanel, we are not to pursue allegations of collaboration, horizontal or in terms of actual spying. A liaison with Baron Hans Gunther von Dietrich is well documented, and a substantial file is held in this office. However, both the PM and the Duke of Westminster, together with other prominent Englishmen, vouch for her. It is implied that Chanel may have been involved in highly classified activities between the Nazis and the Allies and should not be apprehended. It is the case that she may already have slipped the net and may have gone over the Swiss border with the Baron. The, the tribunal reports that when asked about her affair with the Baron, she replied, really gentlemen, a woman of my age cannot be expected to look at the passport if she has a chance of a lover. She was last seen in public in Paris, distributing bottles of number five perfume from the front doors of the Ritz to passing American servicemen. These are indeed peculiar times. Our files and the French courts are clogged with more pressing matters. Take no further action. There was so much dirt to dig up. Dig up. There were so many bizarre, wonderful, gossipy, horrible stories that any tribunal, any retribution would, couldn't possibly deal with it. Coco got away with it. 
Mm. She, she ended up smelling as sweet as number five. <laughs> well, thank you for reading those sections very much. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to go back to the, the notion of this being a multi-form novel and sort of jump from that to ask, isn't this also a multi-genre novel? It seems to be uh, a war narrative. It seems to be a psychological drama. Uh, there, there seems to be, uh, it seems to be, could I say, a true crime novel. Uh, it's a portrait of a place. So it's those things at least. Um, so I guess to what extent were you deliberately playing games with the genre of the novel? Or to put it provocatively, were you trying to make it unclassifiable? Um, no, I think that's an unlooked for bonus, uh, actually. Um, no, it, the, the novel as it exists now, the novel uh, starts off with somebody um, in police headquarters in 1945 making an inventory of these odd things, cardigans, men's hat, sanitary pads, negligees, scarves, pairs of gloves, and so on. It goes off for several pages. You think, what the hell is this? And, but when you see photographs, and there's one in the novel, of Petio when he's in, in facing trial, the background is a whole pile of suitcases. And it's so reminiscent of all those suitcases and possessions left after the concentration camps, the victims of the concentration camps. In it, in it, and and that, that resonates. He, he ran his own death camp in, in, a, in some, right in the center of a, a, a rather grand house in Paris. So it starts there, goes to Hitler, but Petio is the theme going through it. And as you know, at one point, one looks back to Petio. He'd been a communist mayor before the war. He'd served in the First World War. He was a qualified doctor. Was he? Hmm. <laughs> um, he certainly had a successful practice. He could cure everything from, uh, you know, DD to cancer. I mean, it, there's something of the more than something of the medicine man about him. So he, as a character and as a p historical person, and and as a murderer, is is a theme that goes through the novel. But of course, the context is everything else that happened. What was Simon? De Beauvoir doing? What was Sartre doing? Why did Picasso go to greater lengths to save his fellow artist and poet Max Jacob, who was a Jew and who died in Dronson on the way to Auschwitz? Why, why, did, why did these things happen? What really was the role of the resistance? Because Petio, like, when his crimes are discovered, when the smoke from the burning bodies in this house, right in the center of Paris, starts to annoy his neighbors, the police break in, he disappears. He then changes his name three or four times. He changes his identity. And some people help him. Every time that his father, foxy 40-year-old uh, wife is, is examined by the police, and um, she faints, and they kind of give up on her. So, I mean, that was the last question that I asked, or the last one that's answered, or is it, at the end of the novel? You know, Georgette Petio, what the hell happened to her? Up with her teenage son. I, with the help of some friends who were really good at tracing people, I think I found out, or did I? Now that's very interesting, is it? Found out or did I? Uh, a doctor or was he? Um, a novel or is it? Yeah. Uh, a, a study of Petio or is it actually an archaeology of France, of Paris in the war? Um, I think it's both of those things, actually. Okay, that's and all the others I settled in the ambiguity there. Yeah. Right, but it's but you'll have both of those that it is an archaeology of Paris in the war and yeah. uh, and a, a sort of discussion of, of, of an examination of Petio. And one of the things we talked about yesterday, and I know this is at risk of going to philosophy 101, but one of the things you seem to be playing games with, and uh, you're frozen. You're frozen. Has he frozen? I think no, no, I think He's it's. You see, Petio's revenge. <laughs> you don't mess with Petio. He'll freeze you. That has probably disappeared forever. <laughs> a chimney in Paris. I wonder if, um, whilst we wait for Matt to hopefully okay. rejoin us, does anyone in the audience have a question? Perhaps you could put it into the chat and we could, we could ask Tony. Is just, got their my own friend... My dear old friend Hanley Davis from, from Connecticut. So this is truly an international event. Hi, Hanley. 
does anyone have a question? I'm afraid I can't see everyone on my screen. So if you do, find a way of either letting me know in the chat. We, we I, could, I could read the two, the two other extracts that I was going to read anyways. Yeah, okay. okay. Let, let's have another extract and I'll see. Okay, so I'm... there was an extract from the beginning where Hitler's brief, sort of almost embarrassed, uh, not in triumph visit to, to Paris. And then Coco Chanel, this outrageous character, you know, um, What I had realized, again, was how many French people were forcibly removed from Paris from all over France as forced labor into Nazi Germany and so on. There were hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them. Many of them died, of course, there. These were not concentration camp victims. These were la labor camp victims. Um, but when they came back, there was great relief and, and joyous celebration, but also distinct embarrassment. These people coming back, what are they telling us? So this is a poem in the novel called Taking Line Five, January 1945. This workday morning on the Metro, the Gare du Nord, a man got onto the crowded car, one of the disparu, those returning from the camps, forced labor, some dissidents, a rare Jew, a steady trickle now after the flood, and though he wore no yellow star, there was no visible tattoo. He wore his suffering clearly, blackened teeth, sallow skin, ill-fitting clothes, and that distant stare, empty eyes of a Muslim man whose vision had been worn out with horrors. The old lady wearing entre deux guerre Chanel tweed, jewels, and a fox fur rose out of her seat and offered him, and offered it to him. Monsieur, you see, carriage went quiet. We all looked down at our feet, not wishing to witness one of the walking dead. Nothing was said, nothing was said. Um, I, I mean, I, <laughs> If that poem had not appeared in this novel, I would certainly have put it into whenever the next collections, because uh, I think it works. It works in context and out of context. So I hope I'm having it both ways. There, the final um, poem. Some of them look like poems. And some of them don't look like poems, but are. Um, the final poem is that morning, May the twenty fourth. 1946, where the novel doesn't end, but Catio certainly does, because he's guillotined. There's something incredibly French and poetic about being guillotined, you know. Um, Juge d'instruction Doletti turned faint at the thought of the guillotine. Catio, collar removed, neck shaved bare, sat calmly writing the final letters to his wife and son. God knows what there was. Say to him. But to the puking Goletti, it is recorded as he walked to the courtyard. I am a doctor. Do you wish me to give you an injection? One of the ways that Tadio probably killed his victims was by giving them an injection, which was going to protect them for their uh, long, arduous uh, escape from occupied France to freedom. Um, Tadio. The trial of Marcel Petit went on for three weeks in 1946, and it was the hot ticket. You know, forget the Book of Mormon, forget cats. Everybody wanted to go there. And in a sense, that was a piece of theater that would again, let Parisians deal with things, but also entertain them. And Petit was outrageously, I mean, almost like a stand-up comic in the court. He turned things around. He turned on the, the advocates. Um, he, he, he played every trick in the book. He must have known he was doomed. He was doomed. Um, but he made the most of it. He, he, he strutted his stuff right to the end. And so part of the novel is that transcript, transcript of the court case. Except it isn't. Because there is no transcript of the court case. That there are reports of the court case. So everything seemed partially 
and from a particular viewpoint. And so I've reconstructed it with that in mind. Um, Petio had a ball at his own trial. No, he must have known he was doomed. But people like, um, I mean, film stars turned up. Celebrities turned up. It was a, like a celebrity event. It was almost as if he could have sold court case to Hello Magazine. Prince Rainier of Monaco turned up, kind of flew in for this case, which is quite bizarre, isn't it? Uh, you were saying, I'm back, Tony. I, uh, Hello, welcome the, back, Max. You missed gods, a good bit there. You missed a good bit. Yeah, the gods of the internet uh, decided to throw me out. Um, so I, my presence was... I, I thought the patio had got to you, actually. Well, I was going to say my presence was guillotined. Yeah. Um, I've actually got a, a question from Diana Wallace in the chat, okay. and I thought it's a really interesting one. So I, if, I thought we might interrupt our, our own yeah. conversation with this. Does your notion of occupied territory, Tony, relate to your thinking about Wales? That is a loaded question. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't think so. I, I could take the point. I think, you know, um, for Wales, look under England. We, we all know that. And, and Wales Imagination, the book which uh, Nick kindly referred to, and other work that I've done, you know, uh, Wales at War in the 20th Century, has tried to look at what it, it meant and what it still means to call yourself Welsh and to be different. I mean, on, on last week I saw Wales play the number one rugby team in the world, just down the road. Uh, um, two nights ago I saw Wales play the number one soccer team in the world, just down the road. The singing at both those events, the sense of identity was palpable. You know, particularly, I have to say, I'm not a great soccer fan, but at the soccer stadium, the singing was astonishing and intimidating. I just didn't want to be a Belgian on that pitch. You know, it, it does affect the opposition. Whatever it means to be Wales, and however occupied we may claim to be, and incidentally, I've sold my second home, so it's not there to be burned anymore. Um, we, we, we can't escape our destiny. I'm Welsh. I'm, I, I'm going to be, I, my ashes are going to be buried in, in St. David's Church or uh, Commandment. I was born there. I'm going to return there. I've lived here most of my life. I, I enjoyed my time in England, but tremendously doing missionary work. No? I'm glad to be back here. Is Wales an occupied territory? Discuss. <laughs> very very nicely negotiated, Tony. Very nicely negotiated. I was uh, before the um, the gods of the internet decided to curse me. I was on a roll uh, asking you, trying to ask you about the, the games you seem to play yeah. with with your with your reader uh, and yeah. truth in the novel. And I just wonder how many games there are going on. The Doctor Who isn't the trial. That's the transcript that isn't. Of course. I mean, those are in some ways that's what fiction does, and that's yes. what we do as writers. But are you actively playing games with um, history? Are you mucking around with it in that kind of, I'm, I'm, forgive me for saying these words, postmodern metafiction kind of thing? Are, are you, are oh, you definitely, definitely. You hit the, hit the nail on the head there. So that's definitely, I was, I, this became more, this, this became an intellectual challenge, a creative challenge, a narrative challenge, a poetic challenge. Um, I, I got in, this at first was daunting, and then I really enjoyed it. Are you supposed to enjoy it that much as a writer? I, because I kept turning over new things like Coco Chanel, like, you know, where was Beckett? What did, what did Ernest Hemingway do? How did, he, how did he liberate the Ritz in Paris? Who was that figure on YouTube that you see dancing down the Place Vendôme? It isn't. It couldn't be. It's Fred Astaire. What is he doing in liberated Paris, dancing down the, you know, and I was, it was just exciting to discover these things and think, oh boy, that can go in. And that does resonate with that. And, and, and so it, it, yes, it was, um, it was a challenge. I wasn't deliberately trying to do anything except respond as a creative writer and as someone who's very interested in 20th century history uh, to, to what was being turned up, what was being presented to me. It's interesting that this is, well, a novel with uh, footnotes. Oh, yes, very accurate. They should be referred to at every every opportunity. But, I mean, there is a history of footnotes messing with people. and, and Oh, no. 
<laughs> I mean, I know in our conversations, you've suggested you may be playing a few games in the footnotes. That couldn't be true, could it, Tony? The novel doesn't, the novel ends at the end of the footnotes, and then the acknowledgements take place. Um, the, the footnotes are, well, what do you make of them? I mean, the, the, the footnotes are a way, of course, um, of, of, of giving information which would have been clunking if I try to get it into the into, into the narrative itself. Um, I hope the footnotes are interesting, um, but they should be approached with caution. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the the warning there. Um, okay, I, I'm going to don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> well, be a secret just between me and you and and okay. the internet. Um, the four people attending. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to draw it to a close really I've got a couple more questions okay. but one is about whether you had any precursors in mind whether when you were doing this um I've been yeah. teaching David Jones to my students recently and I thought to myself well there's a kind of multi-form writing here that's very like in parenthesis I'm sure yeah. Tony had in mind but um, I, w- I don't want to break the illusion that this is all happening spontaneously tonight but we did speak last night and when you said in parenthesis yeah of course it's a great book that wasn't in my mind in terms of the footnotes or whatever. Um, but what, sorry, it wasn't at the front of my mind. Maybe it was back there somewhere. And also back there somewhere, um, or rather in the front of my mind, it was a more recent book by, by um, uh, Robin Robertson um, called The Long Take, which, which, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, which is, which, I mean, it's, it's poetry. It is poetry. It looks like poetry. Mine looks like all kinds of different things. It looks like poetry. And I read it. And I thought, boy, this is something. And I enjoyed reading it. And I think it is a good book. And it's won numerous prizes. Um, but the narrative isn't very strong. I thought, boy, what I've got is an amazing narrative. I've got a, I've got a serial killer. I've got an occupied city. And... Um, in a sense, if Robertson can 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 publish that, or is well connected, uh, and win prizes, maybe that validates the exercise that I'm now undertaking. That this can be done, and should be done. Because in terms of a narrative, I could do a better job than that. I, I don't think it's it's a tour de force. But as a novel, the, the Robertson doesn't drive forward as strongly as it might do. I think. Ouch. That's really interesting. So, okay, yeah. traditional finish to a discussion. I'm, uh, I'm going to say you you indicated earlier that this might be leading to similar stuff. So, yeah. is this a new phase in your writing career? Are you going to be known as Professor Tony Curtis, genre busting, multi form novelist? Is this where you're going next? I love this man. He's, I, who needs an agent? I mean, um, I mean, I know it's difficult. I, I. I'm 75 in two weeks' time. I, I mean, you know, there is there is an end stop. I mean, Petty was going to meet the guillotine. I'm going to meet some kind of guillotine. But I have to say, in this rental house that I'm in at the moment, moving to the one that we're buying, and and, and having to organize, reorganize my study, my filing cabinets and everything, um, it does make you think, like, what do I really need? What I found there was, was similar material in the sense to, to, to occupy territory. Um, that has got me going, and I don't want to completely shock uh, Nick Felton, but uh, yeah, there's another novel coming, like like this one, only different, only not so different. And it, whether it's a novel or not, but it, it, of course, you know, it's set in the 20th century. Of course, it has those various elements in it. Um, it does not Fred Astaire in it, but it has Charlie Chaplin in it and Winston Churchill in it. And, well, need I say more? Yeah, I mean, there are some interesting people in this, some artists some writers and soldiers, politicians, um, because what happened in London and Paris before the occupation of Paris is, is I think, almost, almost as interesting. Um, uh, how did we get to this point? And who was involved in that? Um, so that's really what I'm exploring at the moment. Okay, there we go. Watch this space. And I like that you didn't give too much away about it. That's left us hanging on thinking, what's it be? What's there going to be? Who is going to be the pettier equivalent at the heart? Sorry, did I mention it's got lots of racing cars in it as well? 
racing cars too okay right so um from mass murderer to racing cars i'm intrigued let's see what happens so i've got a question in the chat um roy i'm not quite sure how to pronounce your surname there she is um so question do you think your novel mirrors what happens in uh, brussels bruxelles is written here under the occupation i can identify situations and experiences that my belgian family had in the second world war yeah, yeah. um I was in school with Roy, I was in school with his, his older brother, and, and uh, uh, I won't embarrass Roy by telling you how really famous he is. He's the most famous Welshman here tonight for various reasons. Um, Belgium uh, is important for me because the first foreign country I went to, my mother, um, working class people, uh, did exchanges for Belgians after the First World War. Wales and England and Northern England, where she, she was, were very receptive. Um, welcoming to Bel Belgian refugees in the First World War. And as a result, those connections continued. And my mother, as a working class sort of factory girl in Lancashire, went, went abroad, went to Belgium to visit these people. There were connections between the chapels. After the Second World War, when I was just four or five, I went to Belgium, again, through those connections. I think, think there are strong connections between Wales and Belgium. That doesn't answer the question, but but what I would like to say is I've been to Leuven, which the Germans and the Germans earned probably deliberately the one of the most ast astonishing collections of, 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 of ancient manuscripts and books. I, I know about Belgium. I've been to Ypres. I've been there uh, to the men in Gate and so on. I've been to the battlefields and all of that feeds in. I don't know enough about what happened to, to Brussels, but I would imagine it wasn't that dissimilar. I don't know to what extent the Belgians could be accused of collaborating. I simply don't know. To what extent were people in Jersey collaborations? What, to what extent would we have collaborated with people occupied? That's, that's, the, that's the awkward question with all this material that, that, that Roy must occasionally ask. And, and, and it's, it's, it's the question that's implicit, really, in Dark Night. Um, when we were talking earlier, you said this is a novel for the Times. We've just been through a lockdown, haven't we? We've never been occupied, but COVID has occupied us over the last two years, hasn't it? You know, we've been suspicious of strangers. We've been dodging away from people. Um, it's not the same, but it gives you a hint of what it would be like to, to, you know, to be on edge all the time, in private and in public. Hmm. Roy, does that go some way to answering your question? Unmute if you would. Oh, yeah, I'm just uh, unmuting. Yeah, Tony's quite right. He went to school with my brother. They are much older than me, as you can tell with the lack of hair up there. But um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward uh, to reading Tony's book. And uh, I do a lot of family history and genealogy. And uh, I've covered a hell of a lot in Belgium, but I'm. I'm itching to put more meat on the bones, so to speak. Yeah. I have some documents, uh, Red Cross letters from my, uh, from my father to his family out there in occupied Belgium, one from a friend of his who was flown back into uh, Belgium uh, to work with the resistance. All right. But then uh, somebody recognised him and uh, told the Germans, and of course he was executed. And this was a letter he wrote to his mother about an hour before the execution. And he asked for it to be sent to all his friends. And even now I've got gooses all over me, just yeah. thinking of what he experienced. That is just minor little thing. But this- uh, actually, actually, Roy, the, the, your preempt, again, the, the, the next novel, if it ever appears, will deal with some of that. The, the amazing efforts of dropping French, British, American agents back into occupied territory. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you, that, you should pursue that. I, I don't know. And you're clearly in a position to discover to what extent that happened in Belgium as well. Yeah, you, you, uh, you've uh, given me, um, dare I say, some inspiration. They say that a lot in sport now. And you've just given me a bit of uh, that carrot to go a bit further and find out. 
what really happened, you know, and... Right. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch about that, right? Yeah, yeah uh, just one final thing. My grandfather won the Croix de Guerre in World War I right. as part of a company. World War II, uh, my father, as a 17-year-old, uh, was a refugee over to this country and went back into Belgium and is in Normandy, and he won the Croix de Guerre as an individual. But my grandfather, Croix de Guerre, uh, I found out he was also a policeman in Brussels in World War II during the occupation. So the reaction of his neighbours to that, he had to disprove that he was not collaborating, and asking, which he definitely wasn't. Well, you better write that novel before one of the fellow contributors tonight gets it. That's, that's not fictional material. That, that's your life. And yes. I think you've got to write this. Yeah. I was interested on the mirror image. On a, 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 we'll you meet up in Kamarthen and talk about this at great length. I look forward to that. Yeah, the coffee's on you. Right. <laughs> well, there, there's the start of another. There's the start of another novel. That's fantastic, yeah. Yeah. And, a, and an ongoing conversation about. Uh, we've got some comments in the chat about occupation, actually. And um, uh, Hugh Bird said that maybe a subject for future use, uh, Tony. If you are, um, if you're still thinking along the occupation lines, is the uh, uh, the UK occupied by Romans? Um, yes. So I don't have any other questions at the moment, but uh, I, I was sort of thinking about um, your, I don't have any other questions in the chat, so please, people, send them in, send them in. There's quite a lot of you, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Um, I, I was thinking, seeing Peter Finch's name here, about those traditions in uh, Welsh poetry, uh, in Welsh, Welsh literature that Peter's a great example of, the great example of, of playing around with typefaces. Yes, yes. Uh, th this is um, you seem to have, that seems to be part and parcel of what you're doing here. Are you are you consciously sort of speaking to those traditions of which Peter was such a, uh, a not consciously but unconsciously because Peter and I go back to my undergraduate days when he was in Cardiff. I first encountered Peter and I got involved with a number of poets, Alison Bielski. You hardly anyone remembers anymore. Yeah. A lot of that playing around with things, and Peter, of course, is part of and and a remembrance of all of that experiment of poetry. I was never really part of that, except that in my fourth year, my teacher training uh, year in Swansea University, uh, J.P. Ward organised something, and he encouraged us to do. And I remember getting a a, 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 a Xerox paper box, filling it, putting a poem there, and and. and Putting sand and shells over it, so you shook it to reveal parts of the poem. A work of genius that's been unrecognized. <laughs> so in that sense, I was kind of, into, it was never my thing, but like a lot of people at the time, I played around with it, and maybe I'm, that's what, in deep, deep back in the mind, maybe that was there. Yeah, and, and um, I'm definitely going to do it again, if and when, the next book comes out. It's it's going to have uh, it's going to be visually interesting. Absolutely grand, fantastic. I look forward to more of that, more of this. Um, so we've got um, Lyndon Peach uh, saying that I love the spatial organisation of history. Spatial organisation. That's really interesting. Ah. Uh, the evidence, the language. It seems this enables you to explore what takes us into a war. Um, there's a lot there. Do you want to respond, Tony? Spatial. Could you say that the spatial Organization of history. I love the spatial organization of history. Yeah, I suppose, like, what I take from that, I think, is it. it, it I read history for a year in, 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 in college and then saw the light and switched to literature. I've always been a frustrated historian. Um, history doesn't, history doesn't own a straight line. So why the hell should narrative go in a straight line? You know, I think, I think now, you know, history. In, in the mid '60s, or when I was doing A level, it was a different. Was a, I'm, as I perceived, it was a different beast. History is full of holes. Perhaps the holes are filled by the imagination. Maybe it's not cheating. And historians do this, and certainly adaptations on television of historical characters do this. Perhaps it's not cheating to fill in those holes with our sympathetic reimagining of what of, of what might have taken place. Um, you know, what did Henry VIII actually say? 
I mean, was he like Brian Blessed, just you know, blasting everyone with his side? Look, you know, how could we? We don't know. And even if someone was there reporting how uh, our dear King spoke, or toadies and courtiers, I mean, that's got to be reimagined. And you know, someone like Mantell has done it brilliantly at great length. Um, I can't do that, but I can fill in a few holes in the purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, Lyndon, did you want to? I notice your your microphone is is unmuted. Did you want to respond? Ah, there is still silence. He's, he's left the space. Um, I, I think if I might sort of just bump on from that, when he when Lyndon's written about spatial organisation, I wonder if the idea is that you sort of mapped the city in what you've done. You haven't just told a narrative, you've mapped the city. So your novel can be seen or seen as spatially as a sort of map. Is that going too far? A map um, Paris. Paisley through time. I mean, it really is between 39 and 46. Mm. Um, I've been dying to get back to Paris and as soon as this COVID thing eases, you know, we've got our flights booked. I want to go back and look around the place. And 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 Petio's house where he committed all these murders no longer exists. But some of the houses that some of the other houses, some of the houses I'm interested in for the next book, and some of the places exist. And I, I want to go back and 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 find out physically what they are. I, I want to dine, I want I want to have a cocktail in Hemingway's bar in the Ritz, that's for sure. You know, um, in a sense. The moment he walked in, outrageously as a civilian carrying you know, sidearms and grenades and having commandeered some uh, FFI freedom fighters, French freedom fighters, and, and liberated the Ritz, he was create. It was an immediate um, fictionalizing of, of of the fact of 1944. He, he was. It was almost like performance art. It was serious performance art. He he went on to kill people in the Ardennes. He was a civilian, come on. But Hemingway, you know, was a larger than life character. And when he walked into the Ritz, he knew, and everybody else knew that this was, this was the, the bar was going to be named after him. The whole thing was going to be characterized. It was an instant fictionalization of what was happening at that desperate moment of liberation. You couldn't make it up. You've got a thank you from Peter, Peter Finch. Uh, he says, I have the book, now I will read it. Let's hope many others will too. And indeed, absolutely, I really hope you all do. It's it's uh, it, it's not often I find myself with a book that sort of hits me and knocks me back, but my experience of reading that initial manuscript was very much like that. And so um, Sarah is just putting some things in the chat, but maybe I could ask Sarah just to come to my microphone to say about where you can buy this book, how you can get hold of it. Well, I'll let, I'll let Mick handle that one. <laughs> oh. Oh, thank you so much. Well, uh, you can get it from the Serum website, of course. We're always uh, pleased to see you on the Serum website. Uh, Amazon, there's been a lot of um, um, activity on Amazon with the book and, and other Serum titles uh, in the last few weeks. And of course, go to your local bookshop, support your local bookshop if you can, and uh, generate demand. Introduce them to the book if they don't have it in stock already, so that um, spread the word that way and enjoy the, reading the book at the same time too. Uh, I, say, I think I think one of the keys to this book making a splash is is, is word of mouth. Um, it's very difficult to get national press reviews uh, these days. But if 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 you think the book's worthwhile, you know, tell people on Facebook, spread the word. I I I'd be very grateful for that. I would second that. Please do. Um, if my opinion is worth anything, I thought it was a cracking read. Um, we've got one more comment from Lyndon uh, in the in the chat, which is a really interesting point. The spatiality, for want of a better word, allowed a lot of coincidence and accidents to enter into the narrative, yeah. which fits with your point, Tony, about history being full of holes. And I wonder whether that's a, a sort of an appropriate place to end on, actually, the intriguing novel of a history full of holes. Um, Tony, do you want to have one final word? Send us out with a, an insight. No pressure. <laughs> um, I think I would like people to read this novel and enjoy it and find it challenging 
and find it challenging and imaginative in, in an intellectual sense. But also those footnotes, I mean, some of them actually are real. And there's much more to explore. There are characters here, that, there are spin-offs from this in terms of what, what those characters were in real life, where they went, what happened to them. And the other things that were going on, you know, I mean, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge is in here. Uh, you know, what happened to you find out what happened to Malcolm Muggeridge later in life, but he was here as an intelligence officer um, and, and interviews one of, the, one of the killers involved. Who knew that? I mean, fact and fiction are so interwoven here that I think it's for people to all of just, just snag on something and Google it and find out, is that really true? Is that, did that really happen? Why didn't he put that in the novel? Thank you very much, Tony. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And um, I wonder if everybody could thank Professor Tony Curtis with the usual sort of zoomy kind of clap in the air. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, and to close up, go on, Tony. Thank you very much, Matt, for all your support and, and Nick, uh, both the excellent readers uh, of this novel. Thank you. And I suspect I'm handing over to either Mick or Sarah to formally end our evening. It's me formally ending the evening. Uh, thank you, Matt, uh, for leading us through that um, so skillfully, so provocatively. Thank you, Tony, for the book. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming and uh, listening to, um, to what we've got to say and, and uh, putting up with the, the gods of the Internet. Uh, in some ways, I think, actually, we've only scratched the surface tonight, unbelievably. There are all sorts of other things that, uh, that go on in, in, in the book, the novel, that, um, that we could have talked about. Class, English class is one of them. Uh, victimhood is another. The sense of, um, of well, desperation um, or gullibility or the hope that kills. Um, I think it would have been one of the, one of the issues for, for yeah. the victims, or some, at least some of the victims of Petio. As I said at the beginning, it is a remarkable read. Um, we've not published many other things um, like it. Jim Neat, I think, by Mary Oliver would be a, a similar book, uh, which is also well worth the read. But we're not here to advertise Mary. We're here to thank and congratulate Tony on, uh, on his novel. And thank you all very much for coming. And we hope to see you all again very soon. <laughs>